War and Peace. War and Peace is a novel by the Russian author. Leo Tolstoy. Published serially. Then in its entirety in 1869. It is regarded as one of Tolstoy's finest literary achievements. The novel chronicles the French invasion of Russia. And the impact of the Napoleonic era on Tsarist society. Through the stories of five Russian aristocratic families. Portions of an earlier version. Titled The Year 1805. Were serialized in the Russian Messenger. From 1865 to 1867. Then published in its entirety in 1869. Tolstoy said War and Peace. Is not a novel. Even less is it a poem. And still less a historical chronicle. Large sections. Especially the later chapters. A philosophical discussion rather than narrative. Tolstoy also said that the best Russian literature. Does not conform to standards and hence hesitated to call War and Peace a novel. Instead. He regarded Anna Karenina as his first true novel. The novel is set 60 years before Tolstoy's day. But he had spoken with people who lived through the 1812 French invasion of Russia. He read all the standard histories available in Russian and French. About the Napoleonic Wars and had read letters. Journals, autobiographies and biographies of Napoleon. And other key players of that era. There are approximately 160 real persons named or referred to in War and Peace. The novel tells the story of five families. The Bozhoffs. The Bolkonskis. The Rostovs. The Kurgins. And the Drobetskoys. Plot Summary. Book 1. The novel begins in July 1805. In St. Petersburg. At a soiree given by Anna Pavlovna Shira. The maid of honor and confidant to the dowager. Empress Maria Fyodorovna. Many of the main characters are introduced as they enter the salon. Pierre Bezukhov is the illegitimate son of a wealthy count who is dying after a series of strokes. Pierre is about to become embroiled in a struggle for his inheritance. Educated abroad at his father's expense following his mother's death, Pierre is kind hearted but socially awkward and finds it difficult to integrate into Petersburg society. It is known to everyone at the soiree that Pierre is his father's favorite of all the old count's illegitimate progeny. Also attending the soiree is Pierre's friend, Prince Andrei Nikolaevich Bolkonsky, husband of Lise, a charming society favorite. He is disillusioned with Petersburg society and with married life. Feeling that his wife is empty and superficial. He comes to hate her and all women. Expressing patently misogynistic views to Pierre. When the two are alone. Pierre doesn't quite know what to do with this. And is made uncomfortable witnessing the marital discord. Andre tells Pierre. He has decided to become aide de comp. To Prince Mikhail Ilarinovich Kutuzov in the coming war against Napoleon. In order to escape a life he can't stand. The plot moves to Moscow. Russia's former capital. Contrasting its provincial. More Russian ways. To the more European society of St. Petersburg. The Rostov family are introduced. Count Ilya Andreevich Rostov. And Countess Natalia Rostova. Are an affectionate couple but forever worried about their disordered finances. They have four children. 13-year-old Natasha. Natalia Ilinikna. Believes herself in love with Boris Drobetskoy. A young man who is about to join the army as an officer. 20-year-old Nikolai Ilyich. Pledges his love to Sonia. Sofia Alexandrovna. His 15-year-old cousin. An orphan who has been brought up by the Rostovs. The eldest child. Virilinikna. Is cold and somewhat haughty. But has a good prospective marriage in a Russian German officer. Adolf Karlovich Berg. Petuatnine is the youngest. Like his brother. 
He is impetuous and eager to join the army when of age. At Bald Hills. The Bolkonsky's country estate. Prince Andrei. Departs for war and leaves his terrified. Pregnant wife Lise. With his eccentric father Prince Nikolai Andreevich. And devoutly religious sister Maria Nikolaevna Bolkonskaya. Who refuses to marry the son of a wealthy aristocrat. On account of her devotion to her father and suspicion. That the young man would be unfaithful to her. The second part opens with descriptions of the impending Russian French war preparations. At the Shong Rabin engagement. Nikolai Rostov. Now an ensign in the Hussars. Has his first taste of battle. Boris Trebetskoy. Introduces him to Prince Andrei. Whom Rostov insults in a fit of impetuousness. He is deeply attracted by Tsar Alexander's charisma. Nikolai gambles and socializes with his officer. Vasily Dmitrich Denisov. And befriends the ruthless and perhaps psychopathic. Fyodor Ivanovich Dolokhov. Bolkonsky. Rostov and Denisov. Are involved in the disastrous Battle of Austerlitz. In which Prince Andrei. Is badly wounded as he attempts to rescue a Russian standard. The Battle of Austerlitz is a major event in the book. As the battle is about to start. Prince Andrei thinks the approaching day, will, be his Toulon. Or his Arcola. References to Napoleon's early victories. Later in the battle. However. Andrei falls into enemy hands. And even meets his hero. Napoleon. But his previous enthusiasm has been shattered. He no longer thinks much of Napoleon. So petty did his hero with his paltry vanity and delight in victory appear. Compared to that lofty. Righteous and kindly sky. Which he had seen and comprehended. Tolstoy portrays Austerlitz as an early test for Russia. One which ended badly. Because the soldiers fought for irrelevant things like glory or renown. Rather than the higher virtues which would produce. According to Tolstoy. A victory at Borodino during the 1812 invasion. Book 2. Book 2 begins. With Nikolai Rostov. Briefly returning on leave to Moscow. Accompanied by his friend Denisov. His officer from his Pavlograd regiment. He spends an eventful winter at home. Natasha has blossomed into a beautiful young girl. Denisov falls in love with her. And proposes marriage. But is rejected. Although his mother pleads with Nikolai to marry a wealthy heiress. To rescue the family from its dire financial straits. Nikolai refuses. Instead. He promises to marry his childhood sweetheart. And often cousin. The dowry less Sonia. Pierre Bezukhov. Upon finally receiving his massive inheritance. Is suddenly transformed from a bumbling young man. Into the most eligible bachelor in Russian society. Despite knowing that it is wrong. He is convinced into marriage with Prince Karagin's beautiful and immoral daughter. Elen, also called as Elena Vashilevna Kurgina. Elen. Who is rumored to be involved in an incestuous affair. With her brother Anatole. Tells Pierre. That she will never have children with him. Elen is also rumored to have an affair with Dolokhov. Who mocks Pierre in public. Pierre loses his temper and challenges Dolokhov to a duel. Unexpectedly, because Dolokhov is a seasoned dueler. Pierre wounds Dolokhov. Elen denies her affair. But Pierre is convinced of her guilt and leaves her. In his moral and spiritual confusion. Pierre joins the Freemasons. Much of Book 2 concerns his struggles with his passions and his spiritual conflicts. He abandons his former carefree behavior. And enters upon a philosophical quest particular to Tolstoy. How should one live a moral life? In an ethically imperfect world? The question continually baffles Pierre. He attempts to liberate his serfs. But ultimately achieves nothing of note. Pierre is contrasted with Prince Andrei Bolkonsky. Andrei recovers from his near-fatal wound. 
in a military hospital and returns home, only to find his wife Lee dying in childbirth. He is stricken by his guilty conscience for not treating her better. His child, Nikolai, survives. Burdened with nihilistic disillusionment, Prince Andrei does not return to the army but remains on his estate. Working on a project that would codify military behavior to solve problems of disorganization. Responsible for the loss of life on the Russian side. Pierre visits him and brings new questions. Where is God in this amoral world? Pierre is interested in pantheism. And the possibility of an afterlife. Pierre's wife, Aileen, begs him to take her back and trying to abide by the Freemason laws of forgiveness. He agrees. Ellen establishes herself as an influential hostess in Petersburg society. Prince Andrei feels impelled to take his newly written military notions to St. Petersburg, naively expecting to influence either the Emperor himself or those close to him. Young Natasha, also in St. Petersburg, is caught up in the excitement of her first grand ball, where she meets Prince Andre, and briefly reinvigorates him with her vivacious charm. Andre believes he has found purpose in life again and, after paying the Rostovs several visits, proposes marriage to Natasha. However, Andre's father dislikes the Rostovs and opposes the marriage, and he insists the couple wait a year before marrying. Prince Andre leaves to recuperate from his wounds abroad. Leaving Natasha initially distraught, Count Rostov takes her and Sonia to Moscow. In order to raise funds for her trousseau, Natasha visits the Moscow Opera, where she meets Aileen and her brother Anatole. Anatole has since married a Polish woman, who he abandoned in Poland. He is very attracted to Natasha and determined to seduce her, and conspires with his sister to do so. Anatole succeeds in making Natasha believe he loves her, eventually establishing plans to elope. Natasha writes to Princess Maria, Andre's sister, breaking off her engagement. At the last moment, Sonia discovers her plans to elope and foils them. Natasha learns from Pierre of Anatole's marriage devastated. Natasha makes a suicide attempt and is left seriously ill. Pierre is initially horrified by Natasha's behavior, but realizes he has fallen in love with her. As the great comet of 1811-1812 streaks the sky, life appears to begin anew for Pierre. Prince Andre coldly accepts Natasha's breaking of the engagement. He tells Pierre that his pride will not allow him to renew his proposal. Book 3. With the help of her family, and the stirrings of religious faith, Natasha manages to persevere in Moscow. Through this dark period. Meanwhile, the whole of Russia is affected by the coming confrontation. Between Napoleon's army and the Russian army, Pierre convinces himself through Gematria, that Napoleon is the Antichrist of the Book of Revelation. Old Prince Bolkonsky dies of a stroke knowing that French marauders are coming for his estate. No organized help from any Russian army seems available to the Bolkonskys. But Nikolai Rostov turns up at their estate in time to help put down an incipient peasant revolt. He finds himself attracted to the distraught Princess Maria. Back in Moscow, the patriotic Petya joins a crowd in audience of Tsar Alexander, and manages to snatch a biscuit thrown from the balcony window of the cathedral. Of the assumption by the Tsar, he is nearly crushed by the throngs in his effort. Under the influence of the same patriotism, his father finally allows him to enlist. Napoleon himself is the main character in this section, and the novel presents him in vivid detail both personally and as both a thinker and would-be strategist. Also described are the well-organized force of over 400,000 troops of the French Grand Armée, only 140,000 of them actually French-speaking, that marches through the Russian countryside in the late summer. 
and reaches the outskirts of the city of Smolensk. Pierre decides to leave Moscow and go to watch the Battle of Borodino. From a vantage point next to a Russian artillery crew. After watching for a time, he begins to join in carrying ammunition. In the midst of the turmoil he experiences firsthand the death and destruction of war. Ugens. Artillery continues to pound Russian support columns. While Marshals Ney and Davu set up a crossfire with artillery positioned on the Semyonovskaya Heights. The battle becomes a hideous slaughter for both armies and ends in a standoff. The Russians, however, have won a moral victory by standing up to Napoleon's reputedly invincible army. The Russian army withdraws the next day, allowing Napoleon to march on to Moscow. Among the casualties are Anatol Karagin and Prince Andrei. Anatol loses a leg. And Andrei suffers a grenade wound in the abdomen. Both are reported dead. But their families are in such disarray that no one can be notified. Book 4. The Rostovs have waited until the last minute to abandon Moscow. Even after it became clear that Kutuzov has retreated past Moscow and Muscovites are being given contradictory instructions on how to either flee or fight. Count Fyodor Rostopchin, the commander-in-chief of Moscow, is publishing posters, rousing the citizens to put their faith in religious icons while at the same time urging them to fight with pitchforks if necessary. Before fleeing himself, he gives orders to burn the city. The Rostovs have a difficult time deciding what to take with them. But in the end, Natasha convinces them to load their carts with the wounded and dying from the Battle of Borodino. Unknown to Natasha, Prince Andrei is amongst the wounded. When Napoleon's army finally occupies an abandoned and burning Moscow, Pierre takes off on a quixotic mission to assassinate Napoleon. He becomes anonymous in all the chaos, shedding his responsibilities by wearing peasant clothes and shunning his duties and lifestyle. The only people he sees are Natasha and some of her family. As they depart Moscow, Natasha recognizes and smiles at him, and he in turn realizes the full scope of his love for her. Pierre saves the life of a French officer, who enters his home looking for shelter, and they have a long, amicable conversation. The next day Pierre goes into the street to resume his assassination plan, and comes across two French soldiers robbing an Armenian family. When one of the soldiers tries to rip the necklace off the young Armenian woman's neck, Pierre intervenes by attacking the soldiers and is taken prisoner by the French army. Pierre becomes friends with a fellow prisoner, Platon Karataev, a Russian peasant with a saintly demeanor. In Karataev, Pierre finally finds what he has been seeking, an honest person of integrity, who is utterly without pretense. Pierre discovers meaning in life simply by interacting with him. After witnessing French soldiers, Sacking Moscow and shooting Russian civilians arbitrarily. Pierre is forced to march with the Grand Army. During its disastrous retreat from Moscow in the harsh Russian winter. After months of trial and tribulation, during which the fever-plagued Karataev is shot by the French. Pierre is finally freed by a Russian raiding party led by Dolokhov and Denisov. After a small skirmish with the French that sees the young. Petya Rostov killed in action. Meanwhile, Andrei has been taken in and cared for by the Rostovs. Fleeing from Moscow to Yaroslavl, he is reunited with Natasha and his sister Maria before the end of the war. Having lost all will to live, he forgives Natasha in a last act before dying. As the novel draws to a close, Pierre's wife Aylen dies from an overdose of an abortifacient. Tolstoy does not state it explicitly but the euphemism he uses is unambiguous. Pierre is reunited with Natasha. While the victorious Russians rebuild Moscow, Natasha speaks of Prince Andrei's death and Pierre of Karataev's. Both are aware of a growing bond between them in their bereavement. With the help of Princess Maria, 
Pierre finds love at last and marries Natasha. Epilogue in two parts. First part. The first part of the epilogue begins. With the wedding of Pierre and Natasha in 1813. Count Rostov dies soon after, leaving his eldest son Nikolai. To take charge of the debt-ridden estate. Nikolai finds himself with the task of maintaining the family on the verge of bankruptcy. His abhorrence at the idea of marrying for wealth almost gets in his way. But finally he marries the now rich Maria Bolkonskaya. And in so doing saves his family from financial ruin. Though manages to do so without selling any of his wife's property. Nikolai and Maria then move to Bald Hills with his mother and Sonia. Whom he supports for the rest of their lives. They also raise Prince Andrei's orphan son. Nikolai Andreevich, Nikolenka, Bolkonsky. As in all good marriages. There are misunderstandings, but the couples, Pierre and Natasha. Nikolai and Maria, remain devoted to their spouses. Pierre and Natasha visit Bald Hills in 1820. There is a hint in the closing chapters that the idealistic. Boyish Nikolenko and Pierre would both become part of the Decembrist uprising. The first epilogue concludes with Nikolenka. Promising he would do something with which even his late father would be satisfied. Presumably as a revolutionary in the Decembrist revolt. Second part. The second part of the epilogue. Contains Tolstoy's critique of all existing forms of mainstream history. The 19th century great man theory. Claims that historical events are the result of the actions of heroes and other great individuals. Tolstoy argues that this is impossible because of how rarely these actions result in great historical events. Rather, he argues. Great historical events are the result of many smaller events driven by the thousands of individuals involved. He compares this to calculus, and the sum of infinitesimals. He then goes on to argue that these smaller events are the result of an inverse relationship between necessity and free will. Necessity being based on reason and therefore explicable through historical analysis. And free will being based on consciousness. And therefore inherently unpredictable. End of the summary. Thank you.